have an endless singing Jesus loves me. At an early age, I was raised in church since baby words I learned to say. Christ loves the little children repeatedly in my mind. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. But I didn't feel so precious on that day I got molested. In fact, I felt more rejected, neglected from his protection. And all these questions started forming in my mind. Am I gay? Am I straight? Cause it continued off and I felt ugly trapped and so ashamed. I never told her so. Because I feared I'd take the blame. Nobody'd ever know. It was my secret, my pain, my hurt, my shame. I couldn't let it out. If I did, they'd surely call me gay. And I remember when they did at the mall that day. I broke down in tears and simply walked away. Cause I remembered all those times that other boy had touched me And I started wondering if Jesus really loved me how I felt, handling my problems by myself. I didn't need God, or so I thought, but now I felt so empty, indulging in the things they said would help me. Money, sex, and the party life. That's how I live. Education didn't even help. With my brokenness, I kept on being broken with the same pain, same strain, running on one leg, kept getting the same sprain. Crippled, looking at a glass lake, Seeing my reflection in the ripples of the weight I was lost and confused, still bottling my pain Took that bottle to my brain, trying to make it go away But I couldn't, I could never escape I realized inside only death was my fate I'm so lost, which way to go? I don't know All I know is that I need you, God, to take control Please take control and change my ways I need to know I'm safe Right now I'm feeling pain And when I prayed that I truly felt a change It didn't happen all at once But trust me, things did change I've never been the same Since that day I called on Jesus He changed my life in exchange for chains He gave me freedom I've been forgiven of every sin I've ever committed Rid me of my ignorance, Father And show me how to live it I wanna be like you I wanna be like you I hate this evil inside me Provide me with your truth Because the whole
Jesus, show me how to live. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Open Arms. We face all sorts of things in our lives, some of them traumatic. And we wrestle with them, struggle with them, wonder if there's a way out. The good news is that God has proven his love and mercy to each and every one of us in the person of Christ Jesus. And he is the way out of whatever it is and into God's presence. And that is very good news. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together into this place this morning. By the promises in your Bible, I ask that you would, by your Holy Spirit, visit us in a very special and life-transforming manner. Have your way with us, Lord. You know who we are. You know the joys and the sorrows of our lives. You know where we're struggling right now. So help us, Lord, not merely to get through something, but to know you are with us and to know that we can count on you. Because great is your love for us in Christ Jesus. And we pray as always in his name. Amen. Thanks 
to the Lord, for his love never ends. And all the people said, Amen. And all the people said, Amen. This time we dismiss the children for kids club worship and the young people for youth group for the rest of us. I invite you to grab hold of that program you received this morning, if you would, please, and uh, reach inside and take the connection card that you find there. Then grab a pen. We're going to take the next couple of moments to fill these out together. And then please keep the uh, card nearby. We're going to come back to it near the end of our worship time. And each one of us is going to be encouraged to take at least one next step in your spiritual journey. And I remind you again, whatever you put on this card will be held in confidence. Uh, I see them, and then I get them to the prayer team for Wednesday night, and they see them, and then they give the cards back to me, and I shred them. So you can feel confident putting things on here, and uh, it will stay between us and the Lord Jesus who loves us. So let's take the next couple minutes, please, to fill these out. For the old folks in the room, it doesn't need an introduction. For those of you who are younger, ask somebody old. In your program, you also found a uh, envelope that's there. If you would like to uh, make a financial gift to support God's work through open arms, I encourage you to use that envelope and please put your name on it, if you will. And then uh, you can read the announcements that are there, except Deb would like to make an announcement about nursery. Along those lines, we remind you that if you are going to work with uh, our children, our, our teens, you must go through a process that includes a background check. We at Open Arms do not just let anybody who wants to be downstairs to work with their kids. We want to check things out, make sure uh, you are who you are and all those kinds of things. And it's uh, not a horrible process. I went through it myself before anybody else in the church went through it. So uh, we remind you of that. And... Uh, as Deb said, just check and let us know that you're willing to, willing to help out. Well, with that in mind, let's stand together as we sing. We wait for this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with you. Your love is with here, your love is with singing. Open up the heavens, we want to 
see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now, Lord, unveil our eyes. Your love is with here, your love is with singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Cry. 
I invite you to be seated. Lord, we need to kneel before you. For some of us, maybe we find it easy to do so as we recognize your gracious, ongoing work in our lives. And out of gratitude, we, we bow before you. And we honor you as our Savior and our Lord. For some of us here today, Lord, we, we struggle with the idea of bowing before you, allowing you to have absolute sway over our lives because we want control. Then there's some of us here, maybe for, uh, we've never thought about bowing before you, Lord. Pour out your spirit, Lord Jesus in ways that would convince us that we are greatly loved. That you are at work in our lives for what's best, for us and indeed for the people around us. Convince us by your Spirit, Lord, that we can trust you with our lives. Maybe that's the biggest issue that we have with you, Lord. We're, we're not so sure we can trust you. We've been burned by other people. And we think you're just like they are. But you're not. You are the perfect one. The almighty one. The one who keeps his promises. To people just like us. So help us, Lord. Convince us, Lord. Have your way, Lord. You know the things that are going on in our lives right now. Some things that we would give you praise about. Because they seem good to us. Maybe you have answered prayer on our behalf. And the answer seems to be close to what we wanted. So we find it easier to praise you and thank you. But then again, Lord, some of us are in a spot in life where we wonder whether you care. We wonder whether you're at work. We wonder what in the world you're doing. And we need you to reveal yourself again as our Savior and Lord. We need you to show up in these circumstances and situations and, and help us. Because some of us are grieving. Some of us are hurting from broken hearts and troubled minds. Some of us are hurting because of illness in our bodies. Some of us are struggling with fractured relationships. And we need you, Lord, not just to patch things up to make them kind of a better version of what they were, but to work your perfect will and your purposes in and through our lives and with these circumstances and situations. So help us, Lord. You know what it is that we need, and I ask, oh Lord, that you would graciously give to us. Not merely what we need, but Lord, give us yourself as you promised. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. When I wander through the desert and I'm longing for my home. All my dreams have gone astray. When I'm stranded in the valley and I'm tired and all alone. 
seems like I've lost my way. I go running to your mountain where your mercy sets me free. You are my strong tower, shelter over me. When I'm weak, your name is true and holy, and your face is all I see, and your face is all I In the middle of all my darkness, in the midst of all my fears, you're my refuge and my home. When the storm of life is raging and the thunder's all I hear, you speak softly to my soul. Well, once again, I invite you to grab hold of that program, if you would, please. And we have our usual fill-in-the-blanks. If you'd like to do that, grab that purple pen or use the purple pen to doodle, if you will. Sometimes it helps us to focus on uh, what's being said and how the Lord's leading us on a Sunday morning in worship together. Today we're looking at Psalm 11. Kind of entitled thing, Seeing the Lord's Face. Seeing the Lord's face. Now you have Psalm 11, verses 1 through 7 in your program. If you'd like to follow along as I read, I invite you to do that. In the Lord I take refuge. Fits with what we just have sung together, right? Good stuff. In the Lord I take refuge. 
How then can you say to me, flee like a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bows. They set their arrows against the strings to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. The Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates with a passion. On the wicked, he will rain fiery coals and burning sulfur. Now that sounds attractive, huh? A scorching wind will be their lot. Why? For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. The upright will see his face. Psalm 11 is written when David was in the midst of a crisis. Now we don't know the specific crisis that he was in. There's no indication with the title to Psalm 11 that would allow us to see what it is. But we know from the life of David, if you've read anything from God's Bible uh, about David, you know he was in and out of jams of all sorts. And we don't know specifically what this crisis was, but there were people out to get David. They, he was not just paranoid. I heard years ago about you may be paranoid, but there can still be people out to get you. Yeah, maybe that's what David was going through here. He was in fear for his life. And we don't know who the advisors were, but David was advised to run and hide from this threat, whatever it was, to run and to hide. Flee to the mountain. Hide up there where maybe they can't find you. And there were times in David's life where he did hide in the mountains. It's a classic fight or flight response, right? We've all heard about that. When we're facing a difficult circumstance in our lives, are we going to stand our ground or are we going to get out of the situation? Which is the best thing to do? I don't know about you, but sometimes I've struggled with that. Am I supposed to fight here or am I supposed to give flight? How's that? Give flight. I put it as a note here in the program that maybe talking to our Heavenly Father about our predicaments will let us know how to respond. But I know in my own spiritual journey, and maybe you found it in yours as well, that, that sometimes I either fight or I take flight before I even ask the Heavenly Father, Lord, what's going on here and I, how am I supposed to handle it? And then there's been times I've discovered I did the one that it really wasn't God's choice. So maybe we need to ask our Selves. Lord, what do you want us to do? Sometimes it's best to remove ourselves from certain situations. For our sake or for the sake of the person that's really annoying us. And sometimes we need to stand and declare the truth who is Christ Jesus. I hate to use the phrase, sometimes we need to set some people straight. But some of us know what that feels like, right? Yeah thing that we want to recognize when David was encouraged to run and to hide from the threat, but he chooses not to do that, is the fact that we can face whatever struggles we have in our lives with much more than the resources that we are able to bring to the circumstance. Because Christ is with us. We're going to get to that again in a moment. But Christ is with us as we journey with him. We're not facing anything on our, on our own. We're, we were never created to face anything in life on our own. But in connection with the God who made us and who loves us and who gave himself for us in Christ Jesus. And he can help us to know whether we're supposed to run and hide or take a stand. Psalm 11 tells us that the Lord observes everyone on earth. Now, on the one hand, that sounds kind of creepy, doesn't it? That he sees everything and anything about our lives. But it's not meant to be creepy. 
It's meant there the truth declared in Psalm 11 that the Lord knows what we're going through. He sees it all. Nothing is a secret to him. Even the secret things in our lives that maybe no one else, even the people closest to us, are aware of. The Lord knows everything we're going through. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, and you see there the page numbers where you can find that Bible verse in the Bibles that we use here. So if you'd like a Bible, grab one, take it, start discovering the truth after, you know, you start here with what the program says, or maybe start reading in God's Bible. If you wonder where a good place is to start reading God's Bible, uh, put on your connection card. I'll make sure to get a hold of you this week. Text or email or phone call, something to help you in your journey to discover the truth of God's Bible. But feel free to grab one of those Bibles. But here's what Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13 says. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. We often think that evildoers get away with their malicious deeds, don't we? We see some of the horrible things that people have perpetrated over the past couple of weeks even. And we wonder, why didn't God kind of give them what's coming to them? In some ways, we wish that God's judgment would happen immediately to persons who perpetrate such crimes against humanity, we might say. That God somehow would rain down fire from heaven to consume those who do such wickedness. And Lord, please do it before the wicked deeds take place, right? Part of us would like from time to time that God would rain down fire and brimstone like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah way back there in Genesis chapter 19. A wicked city that was beyond turning towards God, repenting and changing the way in which they lived. We want God to take care of judgment on evildoers immediately. When God knows what we are going through, and there are those perpetrators, we might say, in our lives, we want God to deal with them severely and quickly, right then and there, don't we? But when it comes to us maybe being the evildoers, we want a little patience from God, right? None of us want to be consumed in an instant. But God knows what we're going through. And this knowledge is just kind of like, oh, all right, I can see what you're going through. That's, yeah, hang in there, hang in there. No, because Jesus knows what we're going through, we are told in Psalm 11 that the Lord promises to act on our behalf, to act on our behalf in the midst of the struggles that we're facing. Indeed, as we read the story of King David's life, we, we discover there that God repeatedly Protected David, delivered David, provided for David over and over and over again. And that very same God promises to act on our behalf in the midst of our lives over and over and over again. I don't know, don't know about you, but I struggle with God's timing. He knows what's going on in our lives. He's able to help. How about now? Am I the only one who thinks that? Why are you waiting? What is your timing? There are those moments where I think if we could know God's timing, like tomorrow at 4 o'clock, he's going to act decisively and take care of whatever it is we're in the midst of, that then we could kind of time it. We only got so many hours left, but God doesn't give us that knowledge. <laughs> At least not me most of the time. So God promises to act on our behalf. But come on, Lord. When? 
And then we wonder about God's methods, don't we? Especially when God seems not to do what we want him to do. Am I the only one who has ever told Almighty God what to do and how to do it? I don't think so. Because we're mortal. And we want to kind of nudge the Almighty in a certain direction. Because we think that's what he ought to do and how he ought to do it. But God so frequently in my spiritual journey, and you've discovered it in yours as well, I'm sure, that he chooses to work in a different manner than what we think. We have our eyes focused on these three options. God, take A, B, or C. That would be wonderful. But God, in his infinite wisdom and his power that's well beyond what we can do, has a whole laundry list of ways in which he can work in our lives that we have never even considered. And you, like me, have discovered that sometimes it's in hindsight, after the problem is dealt with, that we look back and we see the gracious hand of God, knowing that he's caring for us. The Lord promises to act on our behalf because he knows what's going on in our lives. But again, my friends, we are challenged to believe that he's doing what's best for us. What's best for us. Are you really, Lord? Do you love us that much? Can you give us a hint of what the best is? And often he doesn't. But can we trust him, if you will? David, with the struggle, whatever it is that he's going through, knows that ultimately he has a place of refuge, a place of safety in God's presence, and indeed down the road in a place known as heaven, if you will. But we, like David, want to see God's face now. We don't want to wait for that, you know, pie in the sky, wonderful streets of gold and all that kind of stuff constructed for those who follow Christ Jesus. Yeah, we want to hang on to that hope for what's going to be for all of eternity. But in the midst of the struggles, the difficulties that we have, we want to see God's face now. We want to be like Moses. We read about in Exodus and in Deuteronomy that he had such a close connection with the Lord that he was able to see God face to face, God the Bible puts it. Would go up on the cloud on the mountain and would be there for days. And then come down and his face just radiated the presence of God, the glory of God. We read in God's Bible where he had to put a veil over his face because other people couldn't stand the brilliance of the presence of God shown in Moses. We'd like that, wouldn't we? Even without the blinding light coming off of our face, we would like to see God now. We would like to see his face. We'd like to know that he not only knows, but he's not only promised to act on our behalf, but that he is with us no matter what. I believe that we can see God's face now because Jesus has promised never to leave us. Never to leave us. We can see the very face of God in the everyday things of our lives, and I believe especially in the traumatic things of our lives, if you will, because Christ is with us by his spirit to the very end of all things. When I kind of typed that into the computer, I, I uh, pictured the Lord of the Rings. Frodo and Sam, Mount Doom is exploding. They're on a rock safe with the lava going around them. And they're glad to be together at the end of all things. We have a Savior and a Lord who is with us to the end of all things. Whether it be our personal lives or the world at large, he has promised to be with us by his Spirit, indeed to be within us. And do you think that can change how we deal with the circumstances and situations of our lives? Of course it can. 
So in the midst of whatever is going on, because Christ is with us and within us by his spirit, and he will never leave us till the very end of all things, we can see his face. We can know he is with us. We can count on him. But in the midst of what we're facing, we long for confidence that Christ is with us in the present battles that we face. To help us and to give us hope. When I look at Psalm 11 in my Bible, there's a note that I put in here and it says August 17th, 2002. And then this phrase, I want to see your face, Lord. I want to see your face. August 17th, 2002, I was in Dallas, Texas. I was 11 days into intensive treatment to deal with the PTSD from childhood trauma in my life. Deb had gone with me, but then had to fly back to western New York. And one of the things Deb and I decided to do is that at a certain time, making adjustments for time changes, okay, we were going to read the Psalms together, one Psalm every night. So this was the 11th one that we read. In the midst of plenty of pain and lots of confusion, as I read Psalm 11, I cried out to Jesus to see his face. I cried out to the Lord to let me know that he really loved me. I asked him to reassure me that he was with me in that place so far away from home and that he was helping me through some very difficult things. And I got to tell you this morning, Jesus showed up. I got to see God's face. From the time I prayed this prayer here in Psalm 11, knowing Deb was reading it at the same time, I had almost a tangible sense of the Holy Spirit being with me. It was almost like if I dared, I could reach out and touch him. To know that I wasn't alone. That he did love me, that he was with me, and that he was helping me. I saw the face of God as Christ showed up by his spirit, reminding me that I was greatly loved by my family and by my friends, even though we were separated by many, many miles. Jesus showed up so I could see God as he helped me to understand that the care I was receiving was going to be ultimately helpful for me, even though I didn't understand why in the world they were having me do certain things a certain way. And then to be reminded of persons who were praying for me. Friends, in the midst of a very difficult time, Sensing I was alone, but not. Jesus showed up in such a manner that I had assurance that I could make it through and get on the other side of the pain and confusion because of him, because of him. I don't know about you, but you may be in a place in life where you're just longing to see God's face right here and right now so that you know you can make it through 
not because of who we are and what we can do. As graciously, God has made us to help one another, and sometimes with the guidance of paid professionals, so to speak. But we can know he is with us and for us, and he can carry us through, if you will. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, tells us that the pure in heart will see God. The pure in heart will see God. In August of 2002, I wasn't sure where my heart was, let alone being pure. And God's Bible declares because of our sin, because of our waywardness from the God who loves us, because of our attempts to be in control of our lives, our hearts, if you will, are deceitful and desperately wicked, and there's nothing we can do about it. Even with the best of moral reformation, we may attempt. Indeed, I know firsthand, and I see it especially in God's Bible, that it takes an act of God to cleanse us sinners so that we can be pure and enabled to see God in our daily lives. And that is precisely what God has done for us in Christ Jesus already. He has done the act of God, if you will, so that we can be freed and made clean again. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 gives a little list of who we used to be before we came to know Christ Jesus. It's quite a list. I invite you to take a look at it. And then in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we are told that we are cleansed, we are washed, we are made new by the blood of Christ Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary. And he, take, he can take care of any and all issues in our lives. I'm a person as a testimony to that. And we are given this invitation. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. It's an ongoing chase, choice that we make. And it starts out with if. If. What will we do in the face of God's great offer for us in Christ Jesus so that we can see him and he can help us through whatever it is that we need his help to do. Friends, simply put, we see God when we place our trust in him. When we take refuge in the Lord God, we experience a certain kind of safety and security and protection and provision that's well beyond what we could ever give to ourselves. When we are living in Jesus' presence, we're living by his power, we can be enabled to see him in our daily living in the good things and the not-so-good things, and even in the horrible things. And when we place our ultimate trust and hope in Christ Jesus, then we can have confidence when we are facing life's crises. Friends, our hope is not in the midst of difficulty that, you know, everything will work out in the end. I don't know what that means. Our confidence is that Christ Jesus is at work in the midst of whatever it is. So what might be some of the next steps we could take? Would you grab your connection card, please? Because maybe one of these steps makes sense to you for today. Maybe you want to consider the truths from God's Bible, and already I've invited you to take a Bible if you'd like one. Maybe today, for the first time, we want to place our trust in Jesus and start following him, join the journey, so to speak. Maybe we we'll want to continue allowing Christ to purify our hearts, our thoughts, our attitudes, our actions, and our reactions. I need the Lord to help me with that. I've got a lot of work to continue doing in me. So pray for me, please, as I'm praying with you and the next steps and special requests you're making and I already mentioned our prayer team will be praying confidentially for all of us. Maybe we need to ask the Lord to let us see him in the midst of a specific circumstance. What might that be? I put a blank line there. If you want to give some details, go ahead and do that. Maybe you'll return next Sunday for Jonah, the wrong man for the job. Or maybe God's giving you a special step to take and there's a blank line that's there and you want to jot some things down. In a couple of moments, Lori and Keith will be coming around with some baskets. They'll be receiving the financial gifts we bring. 
to support God's work, or most importantly, they're collecting our connection card. So please, my friends, prayerfully take at least one next step in your spiritual journey, and then please place your connection card along with your giving in one of those baskets.
Remember this coming week that Jesus loves you. Remember Jesus likes you. Remember that Jesus wants to hang out with you. Let's not forget that. Let's live this coming week in the very presence of God. Thanks for choosing to be here today. There's so